Well, good afternoon. Um, my name is Terry Potter. I'm an attorney with Hush Blackwell in their St. Louis office. And with me today is Blake Armstrong, who's also an attorney with the firm, also in the St. Louis office. And Blake and I work together quite often on a number of uh, labor and employment issues for various clients throughout the country. Um, we've been asked to give a presentation to this group regarding common employment issues that arise for startup companies. Um, you know, it, it's, it's hard enough trying to get a company going uh, without having to worry about employment issues. And so it's nice to have a checklist, at least before you get into the middle of everything, uh, regarding issues that you need to cover. Uh, it's no, this is no substitute for seeking legal counsel when you feel you need it, but it's a good start. It's a good way for you to start uh, thinking about some of these issues, which are uh, important to anyone who's starting up a business. Uh, I also want to indicate that um, beyond the commentary that we're going to present today, that on the firm's website, there's a whole host of uh, information sources for not only startup companies, but those companies that have been in business for a significant period of time. Um, and I would advise you to check out our website for that information. We have blogs, we have you know, all sorts of information, data sheets, we have announcements regarding upcoming webinars and seminars, and hopefully there'll be more seminars and webinars in the future. I'm tired of doing this stuff remotely, and I'm sure you're tired of having to put up with it too. So uh, with that being said, let's just kind of kick things off. Um, and the next slide, um, more or less is an agenda about what we're going to be talking about, beginning with, frankly, just the beginning process of when you're going to hire an employee to become part of your organization, and that being uh, providing a written offer letter um, and some of the common mistakes that occur even in that process. And usually it's the biggest mistake, quite frankly, is uh, the offer letter. Offer letter is delayed and not provided to the employee till long after they've started, which can create a, a great deal of issues. We're going to be talking about various classifications of employees, um, in particular, um, who's an employee and who's a contractor. I know that's a hot topic that all of you have been familiar with. Uh, we're going to talk about some wage and hour issues, salaried versus hourly. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, onboarding processes when it comes to uh, reviewing what your prospective employees may have already signed off on with their current employers regarding non-compete obligations, among other matters, um, and um, also, no, protecting, yeah. also protecting your own interest and in, um, having your new employees sign similar documents, non-compete documents, when they I'm come, bar come on board uh, with you. Uh, Jan, it looks like you're not, you're not um, muted. Okay, we keep oh, I'm picking so you sorry. Up. Okay, that's okay. Um, and, and also, um, maybe one of the biggest issues is, you know, you're going to terminate somebody and maybe it's a high profile termination, a high risk termination, and um, you don't contact an attorney. With, uh, frankly, the risk of litigation with any termination these days is pretty high. So um, I'm not saying you have to do it on every occasion, um, but I think if your gut tells you that you're not sure, you're probably best to reach out to an attorney. So in terms of the next slide, we were talking about, again, uh, the offer letter. I think offer letters are a great idea. Um, it's simply a summary statement of the terms and conditions of employment for the employee coming on board. Um, often these offer letters are limited to certain key employees, uh, managers, supervisors. Um, and as the um, PowerPoint indicates, uh, you know, it's just a summary. You provide um, what their compensation and benefit structure will be. Um, you include a statement that their employment is at will, that you're not providing an employment contract, 
by coming on board. Um, you may want to refer to other requirements and other documents they may have to sign, such as non-compete agreements or, excuse me, agreements involving uh, intellectual property concerns. Uh, again, every employer has a, a different set of concerns, but in general, that's all it amounts to. But you, know, you really need to have an offer letter out there because it makes both parties feel more comfortable from the get-go. Uh, the employee knows uh, what expectations are. The company knows expectations. And the problem is, is that during oral discussions, uh, oftentimes uh, confusion can arise regarding what was agreed to. And the last thing you want is confusion. And an offer letter will uh, help eliminate, help eliminate, not totally eliminate, uh, the possibility for confusion um, in terms of their employment terms. So, you know, that's the, the first item I think you need to consider and in, in terms of uh, employment issues. And I know Blake's going to be talking about um, some additional issues and concerning um, who's an employee and who's an independent contractor. So, uh, again, as Terry mentioned, my name is Blake Armstrong. Hopefully you can see me now. Um, and I would be I'm going to start by talking about the employee versus independent contractor classification issues. So this is, uh, as Terry mentioned at the start, a pretty hot issue right now. The Department of Labor and pretty much every state agency has begun scrutinizing these relationships, especially over the last few years. Uh, state unemployment agencies are scrutinizing these pretty hard. So uh, as a startup company, you there, there's a good chance you only have a, a handful of employees at the time, but as you grow, you will grow in your size of employees as well. And as you at the start, a lot of startup companies contract out a lot of work, whether it's human resources or other work. And at the start, that might work well. The independent contractor, the individual might be doing two hours for your company and then this, the same for a variety of other companies in the area. As you grow, your needs are going to grow as well, and the needs you need from that, or the needs you have from that individual, will grow too. And with that, the degree of control will rise as we get going. So, uh, as the companies involve, so do your relationships with the individuals that are working for you. And the key with this is to be in front of the relationship. Uh, you want to be thinking about where you see your company moving in the months and years ahead, and then where you see your relationships with the individuals helping and working for you moving in the months and years ahead. Uh, as you see the degree of control, and, and on the slide, we see some of the factors. So the, the employee independent contractor classification is very fact intensive, and there's um, some of these factors we can touch on now, whether the, the degree of control, whether the employee or independent contractor, whether the individual sets his or her own schedule, um, is the, do they have a compensation structure? Is there periodic reporting? Do they have training requirements? Uh, will that individual submit reimbursement for expenses? And then this last one here is something that's probably very easy to see. Uh, is it an exclusive or non-exclusive relationship? In that example that I talk, touched on at the start, if it's an individual that's spending a few hours with your company and a few hours with a variety of other companies, that's obviously not an exclusive relationship. That's something that is kind of the quintessential independent contractor situation. Well, as your company grows, if that employee or that person starts to spend 10, 20, 30 hours a week on site, they're participating in meetings and trainings, and it becomes maybe more of an exclusive relationship. That's something that these, uh, the Department of Labor, these state agencies will start to scrutinize a little bit more. And then the last thing is really key, uh, a written contractor agreement. While that is great to have if you're classifying an individual as an independent contractor, it is not controlling. Uh, the agencies, the Department of Labor and the courts will look at the facts and at the relationship when determining whether an individual is an employee or an independent contractor. Um, I, I would again want to be very clear that the existence of a contractor agreement is not is not exact is not a perfect shield, but it is important to have. All right. All good all good thoughts. Um, the other issue that arises uh, from my experience is that there's 
commonly a misunderstanding as to which employees are exempt um, under the federal wage and hour laws from being subject to uh, the requirement to pay overtime for working over 40 hours in a work week. Um, some, some individuals are under the belief falsely that the easiest way to avoid that obligation is simply to pay an employee a salary. And that automatically exempts them from the requirement of paying overtime. Well, I wish it was that simple, but it's not. Um, and so you have to be uh, very aware of the duties and functions of all your employees so that you can, frankly, uh, put them in the right silo in terms of whether they're exempt or non-exempt employees. Um, and I've listed in the PowerPoint um, the, the stock standard exemptions that are allowed under federal law so that you need not pay these individuals overtime after 40 hours in a work week. Now, the most common one that we all understand, I think, right out of the box is the so-called executive uh, exemption where somebody is a manager or supervisor. You know, they manage or supervise a particular department um, of the company. Uh, and, and, and they manage or supervise more than two employees, and they are allowed to, to uh, discipline and, and otherwise enforce the company's policies uh, in the workplace. Um, and they're paid a salary. Um, in those circumstances, you know, they're going to be exempt. It's, it's not really a real concern. Um, and you'll see the other listings of other exceptions that will allow you not to pay overtime to certain categories of employees, you know, administrative, professional, computer, and outside sales. I will tell you, in my experience, the most common confusion is the second exemption, the so-called administrative ex uh, ex exemption. And unfortunately, um, people also misunderstand that exemption, and they think, okay, it's somebody who's in administration. Does that include my administrative assistant? Likely, no, because when you're talking about this exemption, um, it's talking about somebody who is managing, developing, and enforcing uh, company policies. Um, they need not supervise anybody, but they must have the authority to enforce uh, and develop company policies. The perfect example for, you know, for most people is your HR manager. You know, that's somebody who normally doesn't supervise anyone, but uh, obviously they're the individuals who are going to enforce the company's HR policies. And so that person would be exempt. Um, but again, um, it doesn't mean your administrative assistant uh, is exempt from the overtime provisions. Um, don't be confused over that. Uh, the professional exemption is simply, as it sounds, it, it's uh, limited to those individuals who, uh, through what they uh, refer in the regulations as, uh, have received a, a, a course of uh, education uh, of higher learning. Uh, believe it or not, attorneys fall in that category of higher learning. Um, not everybody would agree with that, but uh, that's what DOL says is, is the case. Uh, but it also includes other individuals you know, that would come into play too. You know, people with PhDs, um, you know, physicians, uh, again, other individuals who have gone to uh, school beyond usual four-year degree, to be honest with you. You have the computer exemption, uh, which is a rather unique carve out uh, in this situation, uh, it applies to individuals who, again, are involved in the development of computer systems uh, for the company. It's not somebody who's simply a technician. It's somebody who's developing and, and assisting in the overall development of computer systems uh, throughout the company you know, at a high level and using a lot of independent discretion and making sure that uh, the computer systems for the company function appropriately. Uh, in other words, it's it's not somebody who's just, uh, you call to figure out um, why your, your email isn't working today. Um, 
The final exemption is outside sales. Um, most outside sales employees work on a commission basis, and this is why it's an exception. Um, you know, DOL recognizes because of a commission base uh, that usually applies to outside sales uh, that they're going to be exempt from any overtime requirements. So, again, just a, just a heads up regarding the common exemptions. And if, and if you've got somebody who you're exempting right now who may not fall within these categories, you may want to reach out to a labor and employment attorney and do an audit and make sure that uh, you're not going to be subject to back pay or other issues um, for any of these employees. So next we're going to talk about some of the onboarding obligations and issues that come up. Uh, this the, probably the easiest way to think of this is when you're bringing on new employees to put yourself in the shoes of the employer, their, their prior employer. Uh, you want to make sure that you're avoiding breaching obligations and duties of loyalty. So with that, it's when the there's that period of time when maybe you're soliciting the employment of an individual that is currently with another employer. You want to make sure that 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 current employee at, an, at a prior employer is not taking clients, taking information in that transition period, they, that they're honoring the duty of loyalty that they have to their current employer. And then further to that, you want to make sure that when you're onboarding any employee, you ask them if they're subject to any covenants not to compete or non-solicitation -solic uh, agreements. You want to find out that information as quickly as possible, and then you want to encourage and require the employee not to violate those agreements. Now, we see quite often with clients that they bring on new employees, and then if those employees breach their covenants not to compete with their prior employers, that prior employer is obviously not going to be happy about that, and that's often a source of litigation. Especially for startups, litigation can be very costly and something that can be very prohibitive to the future work. It's not something you want to deal with, especially at the as you're trying to grow and build your company. So a great way to avoid that is to consider having employees sign an onboarding agreement that would stipulate to not having covenants not to compete or non-solicitation agreements, and if they do, uh, providing an assurance that they will not violate that covenant not to compete or the non-solicitation. And then again, you want to make sure that you're having the employee avoid using or disclosing confidential information. That's the type of trade secrets that they would have from their prior employer. Again, I think the Easiest way to think about this is putting yourself in the shoes of the prior employer. What what types of things, uh, whether it's client contacts, trade secrets, that you would not leave, you would not like leaving your company, and then making sure that that's not happening here. Because if and when that does happen, that can lead to very costly and contentious litigation. Yeah, Blake's absolutely right. I think this is um, one of the biggest issues we run into in terms of smaller uh, companies where they don't check out these previous agreements that these employees have signed, you know, and unfortunately employees either forget or aren't truthful uh, when they're seeking new employment for a variety of reasons. And you can be involved in litigation so quickly. And the problem is, is that, you know, they're not going to simply come after the employee they're going to come after you because you're a so-called deep pocket. And frankly, they're probably mad as hell. And they think that you took this employee um, and your motivation was to um, use the employee uh, and the trade secrets that the employee may possess, you know, customer information in particular, uh, to the benefit of your new startup company. And uh, again, litigation isn't cheap, and this is the sort of litigation that gears up quickly and, and is very, very expensive. With all that being said, um, beyond the onboarding situation, you also want to cover your own basis, assuming that, that uh, you feel it necessary that you have certain non-compete, non-solicitation agreements uh, signed off by your new employee. Now, um, key consideration here, you needn't have everyone sign off on these sorts of agreements. I sometimes chuckle when I get involved in these cases and I find out people 
including the receptionist, is subject to a non-compete, um, probably overkill, I would say. Uh, but in those situations where you have salesmen in particular who are going to have substantial customer contact or somebody in technology who's going to be developing trade secret information, those are the two categories of employees you really need to be thinking really hard about in terms of getting them to sign off on these non-compete agreements so they just don't get upset one day, walk out the door, and take all this trade secret information with them. I mean, these agreements are enforceable in Missouri. There's no question about it. They have to be reasonable, um, but that's easily, easily um, drafted and documented uh, if the appropriate attorney does it. So, again, I, I think it's very critical that you think about uh, these issues as you go forward in terms of new hires. As Terry mentioned, the reasonableness is the key test there. So when drafting the covenants not to compete, you want to make sure that they're reasonable in terms of the geographic scope, the duration, and the position that it's covering. So uh, I, the key consideration is just don't be greedy. Be reasonable. Think about what you're trying to protect, where you're trying to protect it. If your business is a St. Louis-only company, you don't want to have a covenant not to compete that is nationwide. Courts aren't going to find that reasonable. And in some cases, that can be detrimental to the covenant not to compete generally. So the next thing we're going to talk about is high risk terminations. Now, I know probably most people here will be thinking, well, it's at will employment. We can fire an employee whenever we want. And while Missouri is does have at will employment, that is not the case that you can just terminate whenever for whatever reason you you may well please. Uh, the employer needs to have a legitimate non-discriminatory reason for separation. And so what we would consider a high risk termination is somebody that falls under the, the one of the protective protected statuses. And so that's the most discrimination claims fall or come under retaliation. And then there's the protected statuses of age, race, gender, uh, protected activity, and otherwise. So what you want to consider there is when terminating somebody that falls into one of those protected statuses, you want to see if they've filed a workers' comp claim recently. They've filed a complaint of harassment, not just against the company or a supervisor, but as a, a coworker, a fellow employee. And then you want to maybe be consider, considerate of any potential whistleblower claims. Those can all lead to retaliation um, retaliation lawsuits after the fact, um, even if you think you're firing somebody or are firing somebody for a legitimate non-discriminatory reason. So one of the ways that we would advise companies, any company, but specifically a startup to handle their employees the entire time, even when things are going well, is to document the employer-employee relationship. So that would be through performance reviews. Now, what we see where companies get into a little bit of trouble is it's very easy for an employer or a supervisor to go down the list at their annual performance reviews and say satisfactory to every employee in every category, or even worse, check excellent as they go down the list. Now, again, that might save you time. It might prevent the tension in the relationship at that time. But if you go to terminate an employee because they were just bad at their job a year or two down the line, and they file a claim, what they're going to point to as evidence is, well, look at my performance reviews from last year, the year before that, the year before that, I was excellent, excellent, excellent over and over again. If you're having issues with employees, we would really encourage or I would mandate the uh, documentation of that. Document the issues. If it's tardiness, absent, absenteeism, make sure you have that documented so that when these issues come up, you have the evidence and you can point to those things. Um, and then again, back to the at will point, while the states do have at will employment, there's statutes that will override that general proposition. And that is the statute we talked about, about protected class. Uh, so I would make sure you're doing your due discipline as your, or do, sorry, due diligence as you go through the termination process, whether that's, you guys have a, um, a pr progressive discipline policy, I would try and stick to that to a T if you can, uh, follow the policies that you have in your handbook for whatever that for whatever it is. If it's 
tardiness and there's a one strike, two strike, a written warning, a final warning, make sure you're follow, following your policies as much as closely as you can as you're going down that path. Yeah, Blake is absolutely correct in terms of making sure your documentation is in order. Um, I don't know how many times I've been involved in claims filed by employees and I get the personnel file and as Blake referred to, I see the evaluations and the evaluations indicate the employee was at least average, if not above average, and with no discipline in this record or her record, and suddenly is discharged. How do you explain that to a third party? You know, it's very, very difficult. No matter what the so-called misconduct was that resulted in the termination, um, and if they're in a protected category, um, you know, it makes it even more suspect. So. Piggybacking on what Blake just said, what's also very important is training your supervisors and how to conduct evaluations and how to fill out the forms. They don't know how to fill it out. They need guidance. So make sure that you train your supervisors who are doing the evaluations to fill out those forms appropriately. Uh, you know, let's face it, when it comes to HR, one of the key ingredients is making sure that everybody is properly trained, uh, in particular in terms of evaluations uh, and also you know, the, the policies in general. And we'll get into uh, handbook issues in a moment, but um, everybody needs to be aware of uh, the procedures in place when it comes to discipline and making sure that you are consistent in applying those policies. That's the kicker, folks. You got to be consistent when you when you treat somebody differently. That's when all the eyebrows get raised. So just keep that in mind. Um, anyway, let's talk about employee handbooks. You know, well, why have them? You may say. Well, I think it's a it's a good idea to have the handbook um, for both sides, both the employee and the employer. Uh, again, uh, I think the handbook provides guidance to supervisors and managers regarding how to apply discipline, uh, and how policies in general should be applied in the workplace. If you don't have a handbook for a, re a steady reference, then you're going to have your supervisors doing nine different things. Um, one supervisor will go one direction, one supervisor the other. And the worst thing in the HR world is inconsistency, as I just said. So you want a handbook as a steady reference for the company um, so that those policies are consistently followed. So, so important. Um, it's also important because employees, from a morale standpoint, we don't know what the rules of the game are. I mean, how many times I get involved in union organizing attempts all the time and, and guiding employers through those situations. And oftentimes when you go back and, and you interview employees regarding why they sought out a union, it's like, well, the rules change all the time. We don't know what the rules are. We didn't have an employee handbook. Um, you know, a different manager came in, there was a different viewpoint. So it's those sorts of things that can really undermine the workplace uh, very quickly. Um, so again, handbooks can be very important in making sure that doesn't happen. Um, also, let's just jump over to the next slide here. Um, let's just talk about certain required policies that from, from Terry Potter's perspective, um, what do I consider required policies? Well, I think number one is that you want a policy stating that you're an equal employment opportunity employer. You know, trust me, every time that there's a charge filed to EEOC or Missouri Commission, Commission on Human Rights, they're going to want to know whether you have such a policy. Put it in your handbook. It is so easy. And it gives you um, a head start when dealing with these agencies on claims of discrimination. You know, other policies that you want to set forth are uh, uh, policies regarding disability. And in particular, as noted in the PowerPoint, that you have a policy of reasonably accommodating employees who may have a disability. Say that in your handbook. State out what, the, what your position is. Uh, it's to your benefit, and it, it's minimal effort. In this day and age, we, we, we all hear it day in and day out of 
claims of harassment in the workplace. Um, what the courts have said over and over again is that if you have a harassment policy in place, and in particular, a complaint procedure in place, and the employee who's alleging harassment doesn't use that process, you know, that can be a very strong defense if you are subject to a charge. So critical that you have those sorts of policies in your handbook. Your handbook should also state that every employee is subject to at-will employment. Just make it very clear. Usually, I emphasize that that should be on the very first page. So there's just no confusion. Um, you don't want anyone to have any sort of belief or understanding that they have a contract for employment. So just say it. Say it in your handbook. And even more important, you have an acknowledgement form whereby the employee acknowledges he was given an opportunity to read the handbook review the policies, that they understand the content, and they sign off on it and date it. So obviously, if there's a charge down the line, and it's, and we our response is that it's, it's based, uh, the determination, let's say it's a termination, was based upon misconduct. And in, in the handbook, there's a policy statement regarding uh, what's gonna result in termination, and this act of misconduct is among those listed. Yeah, okay. We've got that. And now we have an acknowledgement from the employee that they read the policy. They were aware of the policy. They understood the policy. You know, it makes life so much easier for you in those cir circumstances. So that's why handbooks are, are helpful. Um, and, I, and I think anyone who's... who's um, been in the corporate world or the HR world at any time at all would, would agree with that comment. So as Terry mentioned, the harassment policy is one of the ones that we think that should be in every handbook. Uh, this is something that, again, reiterating a little bit of what Terry said, this is not overkill. Uh, as you start your company, as your company starts to grow, you might think, well, is this all really necessary? to lay out the complaint procedure and all each and every step of the investigation. And our answer to that is that, yes, it is. Courts have said time and time again that this can be used as a little bit of a safe harbor when issues come, is that we, we have a policy. We've stated it in our handbook. And as Terry just finished mentioning, the employee acknowledged it and signed and dated it as they onboarded, as the policy changed years down the line, they had another acknowledgement form. So it's, it, it is a really really helpful tool when issues do arise, if they do down the line. So again, we think that the harassment policy should include a few things. First and foremost, it should lay out clearly that this prohibit, the company prohibits all forms of harassment. We spell that out, explain it, and make it very clear to all onboarding employees. The next thing we'd wanna do is have a very clear complaint procedure with multiple avenues to complain. So. I think the important thing to remember here is that while it might make the most sense to recommend an employee take something to their supervisor or their direct manager, that's not always possible or comfortable in, an, in a situation that might arise. So you wanna have avenues where the employee, employee could go to maybe the, their supervisor's supervisor or the HR manager, manager or legal counsel compliance. So again, m making multiple avenues so that if an issue arises, the employee feels comfortable and has a way, a, a possible way to complain. And then you wanna ensure a prompt investigation. And then you want to take and have prompt investigations if complaints arise. The next thing is that you want to assure a level of confidentiality, but you do want to be clear in the handbook that that's only to the extent practical, practicable, because if an employee complains and it was a complaint of something that was maybe in a just a two person setting where it's the harasser and the victim there, while we want to assure confidentiality when possible and to the extent possible, it's not always 100 percent possible. Because if we're guaranteeing that we're going to have a prompt and complete investigation, we will have to investigate and speak to witnesses, which in this case would just be the harasser. And so, again, you want to make clear that while you will do everything you can to assure confidentiality, it's not going to be 100 percent practical in every situation.
Then the next thing we want to do is assure appropriate remedial action. You want to say that if somebody feels harassed, goes through the complaint procedure, a complete investigation is done, and the, the harassment is is found to be true, substantiated, that remedial action will be taken. Again, as we talked about it, t- talked about earlier, you want to fa- then have a policy in place that explains how, how and what will happen. If it's progressive discipline, if it's termination, suspension, have that in your policy and stick to that. And then I think this is very important and should be reiterated throughout is there needs to be a prohib- – you need to prohibit retaliation. Now, that – has the black and white and the cut and dry example of if somebody retaliates, they're then, or sorry, if somebody complains, they're retaliated against by termination or uh, like that type of whistleblower act. Well, that's not the only type of retaliation. The other probably more common example would be if one employee finds out another employee complained about something totally irrelevant to them. Well, if they start shunning or ignoring or not working with or just treating different that employee that did lodge the complaint, that's retaliation and that's prohibited conduct. So you want to make that clear to all of your employees that if somebody lodged a complaint of harassment, they will not be retaliated against by the company, by their supervisors, by the harasser, and then by every other employee at the company. So again, we want to make sure that that part, that statement is in the harassment policy. One other comment here while we're on harassment, um, and it goes back to supervisory training again. Um, What we run into from time to time, which is a concern of mine, is um, uh, an employee makes a a complaint to a supervisor, an oral complaint, and the supervisor does nothing. Um, and, And then later on down, there's a charge that's filed that the company didn't take appropriate action, didn't follow their harassment policy. And the supervisor, you know, his defense or her defense says, well, I didn't think they were serious about it. So, you know, it, again, it goes back to training your supervisors to make sure if there's a complaint filed, don't worry about the merits. Go talk to human resources and let the experts determine the next steps. Don't let your supervisors make that determination uh, because you're going to run into some some serious issues if complaints are made and there's no follow through. That's probably the worst case scenario you could have. So uh, just be aware of that. Uh, also in terms of, um, of employee handbooks, you know, st- this, just be aware that state law can have an application here. Um, you know, the differences in employment law between Missouri and Illinois in particular are vast. Uh, Illinois is much more employee friendly. There's a lot more obligations um, that exist uh, in Illinois with respect to uh, an an employer's obligations. Uh, You've got to be aware of those state laws. Um, Sometimes it's difficult to follow. Another reason to come to our seminars uh, to keep track of those changes. Um, But um, it's something you have to make sure that you, uh, you follow. Um, also, um, as the PowerPoint indicates, probably uh, another good point is to have an acknowledgement in the handbook, but look, this is not an exhaustive list of policies. Um, they're the main policies. They're primary policies. Um, but it may not be everything. Um, you know, the smaller you are, the more likely you're not going to have every little policy in your handbook. And, and let's face it, you know, who wants to revise their handbook every year? Um, that's boring for anybody. Um, so, you know, simply acknowledge it. You know, we will change our policies from time to time, and this may not be an exhaustive list. Nothing wrong with saying that. You know, the other thing is, again, putting employees on notice of what we consider misconduct. You know, just make a list. What do we think is cause for discipline? Spell it out. Not only in the handbook, you can post it on bulletin boards. You know, make sure employees are aware of it. Um, In terms of computers and technology and communications, email in particular, um, it's very important to have a statement in your handbook that in terms of utilizing company equipment, company email, 
that there should be no expectancy of privacy. In other words, hey, there may be an occasion where you have to dig into your email from work for a legitimate business reason. Um, so very important that that statement's made as part of your handbook. Um, unfortunately, this next topic, violence in the workplace, is, is become all too scary. Um, you know, it varies from, frankly, an employee being a bully, which I see, unfortunately, all too often, um, to the extremes of where actually have, you know, somebody using a firearm in the workplace. Again, a very scary thought. But you need to have policies. You need to have a procedure uh, if there is some sort of incident in the workplace. Um, and you need to have a game plan very important. And in fact, you may not have something in your handbook, but you may want something internally as part of your management structure. If there is a, a, a situation that escalates to the point of violence, real violence, gunplay, you know, threats of uh, someone fighting in the workplace, um, that should be addressed somewhere, somewhere within your system. Uh, very important. Final topic, alternative dispute resolution. Uh, it's a fancy name for arbitration. Um, you know, very common these days, and I'm sure you're aware of this, where um, employers are utilizing arbitration as a mechanism to bypass the courts. Um, you know, there's a lot of advantages to arbitration. Uh, one, it's private. You know, you're not gonna be on the front page. Um, uh, number two, um, you don't have a jury, uh, and let's face it, uh, juries can do crazy things. We've seen that day in and day out, and that eliminates that issue. You have either one arbitrator or sometimes you have a panel, three uh, arbitrators determining the outcome of a case, um, and usually they're trained uh, to be an arbitrator, they're usually attorneys, um, they're usually more conservative than a jury, obviously. Um, and um, the process usually goes a lot quicker. Uh, litigation can drag out and drag out and drag out, um, and it just sucks your time away. And arbitration is a, oftentimes a quick way of resolving issues. And even short of arbitration, also you can go through mediation. I mean, arbitration is binding normally between the parties, the employer and the employee. But sometimes you can have mediation where you just have an, an independent third party, a mediator. Oftentimes they are also arbitrators in, in another life, uh, come in and try to mediate this, the dispute between the parties. For example, you know, even after they file a charge or even after litigation starts. Most courts now demand that when litigation is filed in an employment context, that the parties mediate the dispute. So why not do it up front? Why not start thinking about that from the get-go? Um, it's a hell of a lot cheaper uh, going through mediation at the very beginning versus having a drawn out discovery process and paying us a fortune um, when you might be able to resolve it up front for a lot less money. So with that, I would just conclude the employee handbook section by saying that this is something that we deal with a lot here in the labor and employment group at Hush. And I would say that I'd recommend reaching out to your labor and employment council yourselves. If you don't have a handbook already in place, reach out to council to think about drafting one up. It's something that can come in handy now during the course of an employee's employment or down the line if it does hit a point of litigation. It's something that, that it, it if, in, if done well, can be really, really helpful as things escalate or, or not. And um, the last thing that we really wanted to talk about was COVID-19 and vaccine policies. Now, we're just going to kind of quickly touch on this. Uh, as I'm about to mention, we have a seminar on June 17th that will address this more kind of as one of the more focused points there. But just want to bring, bring to your attention that there's a few things that should be of concern for employers. You need to be thinking about what you can and cannot do. Uh, two things to consider when planning for vaccinations and vaccine planning is the ADA 
disability related exemptions and Title VII uh, religious exemptions. Um, we've seen that some clients are incentivizing vaccines to, for their employees to come back into the office. Some are just encouraging it. Some have no policy at all. Again, this is going to be something that our firm talks on much, in much more detail at the seminar on June 17th. Uh, and then some of the details for that, again, this is a free virtual seminar that we are putting on. Um, the time and date are on the slides, as you can see. Uh, we're going to have a legal update section where we're going to talk about some of the recent changes in federal Missouri and Illinois labor and employment laws. Uh, some of the examples of that are the joint employer rule, the Illinois business reimbursement laws, which with people working from home, with people working in the hybrid situations are going to be very prevalent moving forward. Illinois and California have uh, business reimbursement laws that are quite a bit different than Missouri and most other states. Uh, we're also going to talk about the Illinois and Missouri laws restricting and prohibiting the use of criminal convictions in hiring decisions. So those are new laws in both states that have come about recently that we're going to be addressing with a little bit more detail. And then there's going to be a handful of EEOC updates. Uh, again, as I just mentioned, one of the big topics is COVID-19 and the vaccine information, vaccine policy planning. And then lastly, there's going to be a section on elimination of bias in the workplace. So all of that will be, like I said, at the virtual seminar that we'll be having it again. It's free. So it's just another great resource as you're getting started to learn from some of the experienced partners and associates at Hush that have dealt with these things hands on with a variety of clients. They can talk about the experience. It's just a great, a great way to get some of the overviews of what's going on, especially the things that we've seen at Hush. All right. And, and yeah, please feel free to reach out to us if you do have any more questions and we appreciate everybody attending today. I hope this was helpful and uh, gave a good overview of what you should be considering as you get started.